you know, the markers wouldn't read correctly from the, the engine or things would just kind of sound like a complete mess, you know. And um, I think there is a slight element of that, you know, there is, you know, it, it, it being sort of so, uh, there's so much variation in things going on. <clears throat> Sometimes it is a little bit close to falling things, I don't know, but um, maybe in the initial stages of when things were untested, you know. So developing a lot of time into to doing it, but then not actually hearing it. I and mean, once once I heard the first track implemented properly, there was a little bit of a sigh of relief because I thought it kind of would work. But um, yeah, initially that was a bit of a fear. Um, um, first of all, I just want to say congratulations. It's a pretty impressive triumph. I was pretty blown away by um, thinking about how it all was done. Which leads into kind of my next question, which is kind of controversial, I guess, but you mentioned another piece of competing middleware, which um, is fairly, I guess I'd say, friendly to musicians in the process of interactive music. Yeah. Um, what was the kind of process you went through in terms of selecting middleware, and, and uh, what was available when you first started, and like, why did you kind of go to work and you did it? Um, well, the, the, it's fairly simple, actually. I mean, although Wise, had, I think, just come out when we started development, um, Blue Tongue, has had a long association with FMOP. Right. And the, um, the music functionality with an FMOP designer wasn't on board by the time we started. And that was kind of um, added midway through our development. If it had been there from the beginning, um, we may well have, have gone the FMOP designer route with the interactive musical, although I'm not 100% sure that um, everything we were trying to do in this would have been available out of the box with FMOP designer because there's so many things which are so custom related to, to the, the way that the, the game works here. So um, there wasn't really a decision to be made. It had to be our own tools from the beginning. That was our only option. Um, yep. uh, just a question. Um, did you have any precedent for how this might work? Uh, because uh, the invention that goes that has come into it is extraordinary. Was there any kind of model you used from another medium or something? Or um, well, right at the beginning of pre-production, the only real preconceived notion I had was that I'd used an interleaving music system before on other games, but it was very, very simple compared to this. It was just a question of having, again, six stems of audio available, but just having three variants of a mix and then each being stereo. So it's that question, that, that idea of having slow, medium, and fast levels of intensity. So that was the initial kind of building block, and then knowing that switching across streams works, but then all that ground stuff and everything was all, was all you know, sort of new for this one. What about any, any musical uh, Stylistically, or I think originally I just saw the concept of the, the painting game and um, thought that that kind of style of music would work just because it's fun and upbeat and vibrant. And the best thing about the whole thing was not having, as I said before, any um, preconceived things thrust upon you, whether it's you know, a notion of what the game should sound like, if it's a sequel or a license, you've got to respect what's come before, but having clean slate is, is great. And, and I was lucky enough to be given the sort of trust of the producer to, to go my way stylistically, and then when people started hearing demos of the tracks, they thought, oh, yeah, it should, it should work. Yeah. What about that chat there? Um, yeah, it had six uh, stems, I just what's the maximum amount of stems you got playing at once, and um, did you prototype like beforehand and mess around that to see what was really going to work, or did it just work? Yeah, like, well, the things? six stems, uh, normally at any one time you'd probably have three um, once, maybe four, and then four while in my crossfade and out of each other. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful, obviously, for, for mixing things, and if you have it all six at once, you know, you'd probably start to overload the, the output if you're not careful. So, uh, that came at a mixing stage where we were making sure that that would sound good. Technically speaking, that there's room to push a little bit more. I reckon you could get eight, eight, eight stems um, using the same system. Um, yeah. How big was the audio team when you did need to recruit any additional? <coughs> um, the audio team was just two people. Um, myself, who did all the music, and the, um, the sound designer who, who did the sounds. The, the original prototype I, I did few of the sound effects as well when it was early on, but then um, uh, yeah, they just, just, just two of us. Yeah. I've just got a question. I've, I've used live musicians on ADR for the film. Yeah. And just um, interested to know, um, as far as the way they work in this production, was there a bit of trial and error on, 
a better understanding of what you were trying to do with the game and, and from there, you know. Yeah, they, they, were, they were pushed into things like slightly new things that they've never had to do before. Um, for example, obviously everything's done to a click, but once the fast version has been recorded, we found that the best way to record the slow version was for the drummer to be monitoring his own drums from the fast version as well as the click so that the kind of groove sticks together. And um, the musicians were having to get their heads around slightly different you know, ways of, of recording stuff. Not used, to, they wouldn't be used to doing, um, you know, that, that that kind of stuff. Another important thing with recording actually was with live musicians was the isolation aspect. That had to be really spot on because if you've got live drums and you've got the congas, you know, normally if there's a bit of bleed or whatever, that's not really an issue. But you might want to bring the congas in earlier than the drums or the other way around. So, you know, any bleed that would, would kill the the recording. I mean, obviously, you know, a tiny bit is okay, but. Um, uh, that, that was another thing to consider for the engineer. Um, you know, I was saying, look, we really need good isolation on, on this. And, um, but once you get a couple of tracks, the, the, the musicians and the engineer kind of understand what's going on. Yeah? Um, for me, the uh, audio in, in, in the blog is one of the um, stars of the show. But, um, how much interaction did you have with design or creative direction? Or, like, was this a core focus for the um, question for the franchise? Um, part of its identity or it just emerged from the ideas? I kind of, I think it sort of emerged as we went, I mean early on the prototype and pre-production with the, the colour of idea, there was the potential to think that this would work, but in terms of interaction with the team, at, at, at Blue Time with the development team, everyone is pretty clued up and communicative and almost, you know, there's regular meetings with the, um, I used to sit and read with the, with the design uh, meetings and have a good working relationship with the lead designer and, and with the project director, um, and obviously with the programmer. So, yeah, I mean, from the, the word go, there was um, a game like this, you know, you've got to be on board right from the very beginning, and, and that really helps uh, in, in communication and general, general direction. You talk about minimizing repetitiveness, you may have answered this before, but Differentiation throughout levels in the game progressing, obviously pacing within one level as your score gets bigger within that one level is important. Did you have different sets of stems or different tracks for different levels so that you could you know, control the soundscape? That's a good question actually. Yeah, we had this thing in terms of, because on, on some of the later levels you score in a different way. Mm -hmm. you, you score more points because there's more to do and there's, and there's bigger levels. So in the early levels there's a few challenges and that's about it. Um, but later on, the, the score can get quite high. So we had a score balancing system where, imagine that graph I was talking to you about earlier, the, the, um, the x-axis would be, let's say, 0 to 10,000 points. But in later levels, we can tweak it so that the score balancing is 0 to 20,000 points. But another, going off from that, what I wanted to do right from the very, very beginning is the ability, which, which caused a lot of headaches from a QA perspective, but I wanted to have any music track that you've already played available on the level so that you can replay the level with a different music track which really does make for quite a different uh, experience to, to the game because you've got not only different styles of music but different musical content and audio content on the same level so the replay factor gets improved once you're able to, to, to select any track that you've, you've already unlocked. Yeah, well, yeah, that was that was tough. Um, but the, the QA guys were really into it and supportive of the whole whole thing. Obviously, with different um, memory footprints for the RAM elements of the sound, it was quite tough. So we knew what the biggest track was um, in the game from a music perspective. So the QA guys would then hammer all the other levels with the biggest track as default. But then obviously, there's all these F mod events flowing around. So many. And, it's human error at the end of the day, it's me typing stuff into Fmod Designer, so if something is named incorrectly, you might be, you know, blue, and you hear all these guitar riffs, and then suddenly a saxophone riff comes out and you're still blue. That was uh, a little tricky, but I think you just need to be fairly meticulous from the beginning and try and avoid those things before they even, you know, rear their heads. Up. But QA was, was a, yeah, it was a fairly big task. Are we only have time to take one more question? 